Everyone knows the Amazon River to be the largest in the world, or maybe some are yet to agree. But one thing we can all agree on is that the Amazon River is more than just a river. A river whose basin is almost as large as Australia, an entire continent. No wonder, not a single bridge has been erected across it since its discovery. The Amazon generally holds too many mysteries that are waiting to be unraveled. From the ancient civilization found in the jungle, to the creepy giant sea creature that lurks beneath the Amazon River. The history of the Amazon River. What comes to your mind when you think about Amazon? Vast green forests with displays of colorful birds, sounds of monkeys and different insects trying to make their way into your shorts. But what exactly is the story of Amazon? And how did it form? Let's delve into the history. The Amazon has a story rich in biodiversity, as well as ecological and cultural diversity. The changes and movements in the Earth itself over millions of years have created the modern conditions for the modern Amazon to exist. At one point in time, the Earth's land masses were fused as giant supercontinents. About 184 million years ago, one of the most intense and massive periods of volcanic activity began. This volcanism was so powerful that it broke up the Gondwana supercontinent, which at one point contained present-day Africa, South America, Australia, Antarctica, and parts of Asia. After Pangaea and Gondwana broke apart, two of Earth's tectonic plates drifted into each other. This collision would eventually cause the rise of the Andes Mountains, which began around 25 million years ago. About 15 million years ago, a massive freshwater lake covered the Amazon basin. But during the several ice ages that followed, water started to flow eastward from the Andes. Sea level fell, the lake started to drain out to the ocean, and voila! The Amazon River was born. The water flowing from the Andes Mountains eroded the landscape and brought sediment from the mountains to the Amazon Basin. This movement of sediment created the soils necessary for the rainforest to grow. But how did ice ages create the biodiversity of the Amazon? This is a topic that has generated a lot of scientific debate and, however, led to some theories. One of the theories states that during periodic ice ages, the Earth's colder and drier climate reduced the Amazon into isolated patches of rainforest instead of the vast and continuous forest it is today. This separated and isolated animals, which increased competition between them. Another theory is that biodiversity rose because the geology of the region was so dynamic. The sea level rose and fell, the climate cooled and warmed, and the rising Andes caused deposition, erosion, faulting, and earthquakes. These can also quicken the pace of speciation. In other words, more stress equals more species, and therefore more biodiversity. Lastly, some argue that the tropics were left uncovered by ice during the last ice age. When glaciers creep over landscapes, many species die, and new ones emerge when the ice melts. But if the tropics weren't covered by ice, then the species that lived there survived. This means that there was just more time for new species to form and for all the species to evolve. Whatever happened, it leaves us with L, the greatest river of South America and the largest drainage system in the world in terms of the volume of its flow and the area of its basin. Since the later decades of the 20th century, the Amazon Basin has attracted international attention because human activities have increasingly threatened the equilibrium of the forest's highly complex ecology. Deforestation has accelerated, especially south of the Amazon River and on the Piedmont outwash of the Andes, as new highways and air transport facilities have opened the basin to a tidal wave of settlers, corporations, and researchers. As significant mineral discoveries have brought further influxes of population, the ecological consequences of such developments, potentially reaching well beyond the basin and even gaining worldwide importance, have attracted considerable scientific attention. Now, to the question that may have lingered in your mind for a long while, who discovered the Amazon River? The first European to explore the Amazon in 1541 was the Spanish soldier Francisco de Orellana. He gave the river its name after reporting pitched battles with tribes of female warriors whom he likened to the Amazons of Greek mythology. Although the name Amazon is conventionally employed for the entire river, in Peruvian and Brazilian nomenclature, it properly is applied only to sections of it. In Peru, the upper mainstream down to the confluence with the Ucayali River is called Maranon. 
and from there to the Brazilian border, it is called Amazonas. In Brazil, the name of the river that flows from Peru to its confluence with the Negro River is Solimoas, and from the Negro out to the Atlantic, the river is called Amazonas. You see, the Amazon River has so many aspects that have opened a long-time debate, and another is the location of the source of the river and the length. For a long time, the absence of technology made it impossible for experts to know the true source of the Amazon River and the precise river length. But as technology advances, it became easier and possible to explore deeper into the extremely remote locations of the Amazon's head streams and to more accurately measure stream lengths. Beginning in the 1950s, explorers of the region cited various mountains in Peru as possible sources, but they did so without taking precise measurements or applying hydrological research. An expedition in 1971 sponsored by the National Geographic Society pinpointed Carohasanta Creek, which runs off the north slope of Mount Mizmi in southern Peru as the source of the river. This location became widely accepted in the scientific community and remained so until the mid-1990s, although a Polish expedition in 1983 contended that the source of the river was actually another stream nearby Apachita Creek. But with the introduction of global positioning system technology in the 1990s, researchers again attempted to navigate the entire length of the Amazon. The American geographer Andrew Johnston of the Smithsonian Institution's Air and Space Museum in Washington, D.C., employed GPS gear to explore the various Andean rivers that flow into the Amazon, using the definition of the river's source as being the farthest point from which water could flow into the ocean and where that water flows year-round. This point eliminates the rivers that freeze in winter. He then concluded that the source was Karahasanta Creek on Mount Mismi. By the early 21st century, advanced satellite imagery technology was allowing researchers to match the river's dimensions even more precisely. In 2007, an expedition that included members of Brazil's National Institute for Space Research and other organizations traveled to the region of Carohasanta and Apachita Creeks in an attempt to determine which of the two was the true source of the Amazon. Their data revealed that Apachita was six miles longer than Carohasanta and carries water year-round, and they concluded that Apachita Creek was indeed the source of the Amazon River. Now, to the length of the river. The team proceeded to measure the length and as part of this process, they had to determine from which of the Amazon's three main outlets to the sea to begin the measurement. Eventually, they chose to use the southern channel and estuary, since that constituted the longest distance from the source of the river to the ocean. According to their calculations, the southern outlet lengthened the river by 219 miles. Their final measurement for the length of the Amazon from Apachita Creek to the mouth of Marajo Bay was about 4345 miles. For years, it's always been a debate about if the Amazon River is longer than the Nile River, and fortunately, this team of researchers used the same technology and methodology to measure the length of the Nile River, which they determined to be about 4258 miles, a value that was someone 25 miles longer than previous calculations for the Nile, but nearly 90 miles shorter than the length the group gave for the Amazon. Now, we can't even agree that the Amazon is the world's longest river, supplanting the Nile. This is because a river like the Amazon has a highly complex and variable stream bed, made more so by seasonal climatic factors, which complicates the process of obtaining an accurate measurement. Thus, the final length of the river remains open to interpretation and continued debate. One other thing that's up for debate is the myth surrounding the Amazon River. There are stories about mysterious animals and creepy supernatural beings living within the Amazon River. Although no one has shown any evidence, there are speculations about a creature lurking underneath the Amazon River. Who or what is under the Amazon River? We will soon discuss this in the latter part of this video, but for now, let's talk about those who inhabited the Amazon. Legends have circulated for centuries that lost cities existed deep within the forests. A search for El Dorado, a supposed city of gold, lured many Spanish explorers far off the map, and some of them never returned. As recently as the 20th century, British explorer Percy Fawcett searched for what he believed was the lost city of Z. He vanished into the jungle and added his own unfinished chapter to a tale that began 600 years ago. Now here's the twist. There are actually ancient cities in the Amazon. Are you surprised yet? Although the urban ruins remain extremely difficult to find in thick, remote forests, a key technology 
technology has helped change the game. Perched in a helicopter some 650 feet up, scientists used light-based remote sensing technology to digitally deforest the canopy and identify the ancient ruins of a vast urban settlement around Llanos de Mojos in the Bolivian Amazon that was abandoned some 600 years ago. The new images reveal in detail a stronghold of the socially complex Casarabe culture that existed between 500 to 1,400 CE with urban centers, boasting monumental platforms and pyramid architecture. Raised causeways connected a constellation of suburban-like settlements, which stretched for miles across a landscape that was shaped by a massive water control and distribution system with reservoirs and canals. The site is the most striking discovery to suggest that the Amazon's rainforest wilderness was actually heavily populated and in places quite urbanized for many centuries before recorded history of the region began. Before this discovery, hands-on archaeological work and other remote sensing efforts had revealed hundreds of isolated sites across more than 1,700 square miles of the Llano de Mojos region, including settlements inhabited year-round by the Casarabe. These people hunted, fished, and farmed staple crops like maize. Some 600 miles of causeways and canals had also been identified, but the logistical challenges of mapping them in a remote tropical forest hampered efforts to connect the dots and see if or how they were related to one another. The challenge faced by the researchers was the difficulty in exploring the remains from the air. However, the team conducted airborne LIDAR mapping of six different areas, ranging in size from about 4 square miles to 32 square miles, to reveal the Kazarabi culture as mentioned earlier. The images showed 26 unique sites, including 11 that were previously unknown. Among the 26 were two large urban centers, Landivar and Katoka. They were already known to exist, but the new maps detailed their archaeological complexity and vast size to be 1.2 and 0.5 square miles respectively. Each large center is surrounded by successive rings of moat and rampart fortifications. Now the question is, who were the Casarabes? A decade of archaeological work in the region has shown that their culture was distinct, and the region they inhabited was likely an annually flooded savanna with riverside forests, rather than the vast, unbroken stand of timber one finds in the area today. What is missing in history is what happened to the Casarabe and their settlements, which remains a mystery. But dating at the sites suggests that their occupation ended around 1400 CE before European arrival in the Amazon. Widespread drought may have been the culprit. This was theorized because at various sites, the team of researchers found huge reservoirs for water storage, which isn't something one would immediately expect in an Amazon region known for plentiful rainfall. This is probably what happened to this culture, but how can we be sure? I guess we'll never know what truly happened to them. Though this culture faced an unknown end, the culture adds to the growing evidence that the Amazon isn't actually one of the world's great untouched wilderness areas and wasn't even an unbroken forest until relatively modern times. So next time you want to think about Amazon or talk about it, you may want to do it differently. The flow. The Amazon River's main outlets are the two channels north of Marajo Island, a lowland somewhat larger in size than Denmark, through a cluster of half-submerged islets and shallow sandbanks. There, the mouth of the river is 40 miles wide. The port city of Belém, Brazil, is in the deep water of the Para River estuary south of Marajo. The Para is fed chiefly by the Tocantins River, which enters the Para southwest of Belém. The port city's link with the main Amazon channel is either north along the ocean frontage of Marajo or following the deep but narrow channels of Breves that bound the island on the west and southwest and link the Para River with the Amazon. There are more than 1,000 tributaries of the Amazon that flow into it from the Guyana Highlands, the Brazilian Highlands, and the Andes. Six of these tributaries, namely the Japura, Jurua, Madeira, Negro, Purus, and Xingu rivers, are each more than 1,000 miles long, while the Madeira River exceeds 2,000 miles from source to mouth. The largest ocean-going ships can ascend the river 1,000 miles to the city of Manaus, Brazil, while lesser freight and passenger vessels can reach Iquitos, 
Peru, 1,300 miles farther upstream, at any time of year. The sedimentary axis of the Amazon basin comprises two distinct groups of landforms, the Vardzia, or floodplain of alluvium of Holocene age, which in it is up to about 11,700 years old, and the terra firme, or upland surfaces of Pliocene and Pleistocene materials, those from 11,700 to 5,300,000 years old, that lie well above the highest flood level. The floodplain of the main river is characteristically 12 to 30 miles wide, which is bounded irregularly regularly by low bluffs 20 to 100 feet high, beyond which the older undulating upland extends both north and south to the horizon. Occasionally these bluffs are undercut by the river as it swings to and fro across the alluvium, producing the terra cida, or fallen land so often described by Amazon travelers. At the city of Obidos, Brazil, where the river width is some 1.25 miles, a low range of relatively hard rock narrows the otherwise broad floodplain. The streams that rise in the ancient crystalline highlands are classified as either black water, which includes Jari, Negro, and Tocantins Araguaia, or clear water, which are Trombetas, Shingu, and Tapajos. The Blackwater tributaries have higher levels of humic acids which cause their dark color and originate in nutrient-poor, often sandy uplands, so they carry little or no silt or dissolved solids. Clearwater tributaries have a higher mineral content and lower levels of humic acids. Some rivers flow as clear water during the rainy season and black water during the dry season. Where such Blackwater tributaries enter the main river, they are sometimes blocked off to form funnel-shaped freshwater lakes or estuaries as at the mouth of the Tapajos. In contrast, the Madeira River, which joins the Amazon some 50 miles downstream from Manaus, and its principal affluents, the Purus, Jurua, Ukayali, and Hualaga on the right or southern bank, and the Japura, Putumayo, and Napo from the northwest, have their source in the geologically youthful and tectonically active Andes. There they pick up the heavy sediment loads that account for their whitewater designation. Where the silt-laden waters of the Amazon, derived from these streams, meet those of the Negro at Manaus. The darker, and hence warmer and sediment-free waters of the latter tend to be overrun by those of the Amazon, creating a striking color boundary that is erased by turbulence downstream. The Mother River, the Maranon above Iquitos, rises in the central Peruvian Andes at an elevation of 15,870 feet in a small lake in the Cordillera Huayhuash above Cerro de Pasco. The Holaga and Ucayali, major right-bank affluents of the Maranon, originate considerably farther south, and the headwaters of the deeply entrenched Apurimac and Urubamba, tributaries at the confluence of the Ucayali, reach to within 100 miles of Lake Titicaca, the farthest of any stream in the system from the Great River's mouth. A river under the river. All that we have known and seen just from the surface is the great Amazon River, and maybe the river creatures lurking underneath. But who could have imagined that the Amazon River has another river flowing right under it? Here's the full gist. Brazilian scientists found a new river in the Amazon basin, around four kilometers underneath the Amazon River. This river, named the Rio Hamza after the head of the team of researchers, surprisingly appears to be as long as the Amazon River but up to hundreds of times wider. Both the Amazon and Hamza flow from west to east and are around the same length, at 6,000 kilometers. But whereas the Amazon ranges from 1 kilometer to 100 kilometers in width, the Hamza ranges from 200 kilometers to 400 kilometers. The underground river starts in the Acre region under the Andes and flows through the Solimos, Amazonas, and Marajo basins before opening out directly into the depths of the Atlantic Ocean. The Amazon flows much faster than the Hamza, however, draining a greater volume of water. Around 133,000 meter cube of water flows through the Amazon per second at speeds of up to 5 meters. The underground river's flow rate has been estimated at around 3,900 meter cube per second, and it barely inches along at less than a millimeter per hour. The Hamza was located using data collected inside a series of two 41 abandoned deep wells that were drilled in the Amazon region by the petrochemical company Petrobras in the 1970s and 1980s. The researchers used a mathematical model to predict the presence of the underground river based on the measured changes in temperature down the wells. According to the researchers, the flow of groundwater was almost vertical through the rocks 
to depths of around 2,000 meters. After this, the water flow changes direction and becomes almost horizontal. Additionally, the presence of the Rio Hamza River might account for the relatively low salinity of the waters around the mouth of the Amazon. Presently, more work is being done to confirm the existence of the flow with additional measurements. Now, it's time for today's subscriber pick. You must have heard about Bigfoot and maybe the Loch Ness Monster, but what about the giant anaconda? The giant anaconda is a fascinating creature, widely known as the mother of water. This creature has been described in different ways by different people who have explored the Amazon River over the years. But for now, the popular questions remain. Does this river monster exist? And if it does, is it the supernatural creature known to rule the underwater of the Amazon River? As we continue to explore this great river, we are left to find out who or what is under the Amazon River. Let's find out as we continue to unravel the mystery of the river. But before we tell you all that we know, let's hear from you. Do you think this creature truly exists? Let us know in the comment section. The Mother of Water the giant anaconda was first described by the 19th century explorer Percy H. Fawcett. According to him and others in history who have claimed to have seen the giant anaconda, the massive prehistoric snake is over 40 feet long and at least 30 centimeters in diameter. To some, this giant snake is called Yakumama, meaning mother of water. However, Fawcett didn't agree with these measurements, especially the length. He described the giant snake to be over 100 feet long and also said it resides in the Amazon River Basin. Though many claims have been made, no official sightings or evidence of this monster's existence have come to light. Myth or truth? Let's dive deeper. Generally, anacondas are a large group of snakes found in and around the Amazon rainforest in South America. Specifically, there are four species of anaconda. The green anaconda, the yellow anaconda, the dark spotted anaconda, and the Bolivian anaconda. They are all members of the boa species. The most common breed of anaconda is also the largest, the green anaconda, which has also been nicknamed the common anaconda and the giant anaconda. Haul up, this giant anaconda is different from the mother of water. Anacondas are semi-aquatic snakes, meaning they exist on land, but also excel at swimming in the rapid waters of the Amazon. Most who claim the existence of the giant anaconda say it hides by camouflaging in deep waters. But if there's anything we know, it is that the largest confirmed species of the green anaconda only reaches approximately between 10 to 17 feet, though one report claims to have found one that was 23 feet long. Clearly this rumored species is not the giant anaconda. Can it be a reticulated python? Reticulated pythons are longer than anacondas, reaching upwards of 20 feet in length, but are unlikely to have been the famed giant anaconda, as they are not nearly wide or bulky enough to match the description provided by Percy H. Fawcett and others. Green anacondas may be shorter, but are a much larger snake than pythons. They can reach weights of over 500 pounds in some cases, while reticulated pythons only reach a bit under 200 pounds. The girth of the anaconda distinctly separates it from the reticulated python in terms of recognition. Percy H. Fawcett first claimed a sighting of this creature in the early 1900s. He started his expedition in 1906 in Brazil, and by 1907, he had traveled to Bolivia, where he claimed he killed a massive serpent-like creature that he found swimming in the murky waters around his boat. According to Fawcett, this snake was around 62 feet long and at least one foot in diameter. At the time, Fawcett had also made several additional statements, claiming to have seen other unknown creatures including a dog with two noses and the giant Apazaka spider. But no one believed Fawcett, since there was no evidence of his sightings. What we do know is it is possible that the two-nosed dogs he had seen may have been double-nosed Andean tiger hounds, which originated in Bolivia, and the Apazaka spider may have been a Brazilian wandering spider. Can we agree that if these two claims are true, then the giant anaconda is not a complete myth? Evidence for the serpent. As mentioned earlier, Fawcetty isn't the only one who has claimed to have seen the giant anaconda in more recent years. Mike Warner, an Irish lithographer, claimed to have found evidence of the creature using satellite photography in 2009. Also, a Peruvian man named Juan Carlos Palomino claims to have seen and killed an anaconda approximately 40 feet long during a military expedition, a truly huge snake that could not be a mere green anaconda. But beyond the individual sightings, there are also the stories in the oral history of the region. Amazonian natives also tell legendary stories about the massive Yakumama that was over 100 feet long. This region 
region is widely known for crazily big snakes, so if these accounts are coming from this region, the chance of this river monster's existence is high. Do you agree? What do you think about the mysterious river and all that surrounds it? Let us know your thoughts in the comment section. Thank you for watching. See you in the next one.